Right, we're going to get to the parts we spoke about earlier. But now I first want to do the basis of this new spirituality, which is becoming the vogue. And that's the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Now when you read them, we as Adventists would think, but this is insane. And yet, in all its subtle forms, it's coming right into our own ranks. So we have to be very, very careful. These are the exercises that every Jesuit practices. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing. You come to a first prelude, and that is, you see the place. So you go into a prayer, into a secluded place, and then you start visualizing and you see the place, whatever it is. Jesus walking uh, around the Sea of Galilee, walking into Peter's house, whatever the scene. And then you use this as a contemplation or a meditation. So you go to a place where, where she wa Jesus' mother was or whatever. And then you come again and you go through the same thing. You have a prayer, preparatory prayer, the usual one. Then you see the place. And with the sight of your imagination, you go to the place and you ask for grace. And then just before me, a human king chosen by God. So this is the first point, to put before me a human king chosen by God, our Lord, whom all Christian princes and men reverence and obey. Oops. So, you substitute something human, but it must be someone who's honored, whom all princes obey. Who would that be? It must be the Pope. When they asked George Bush, what do you see when you look into the eyes of the Pope? He said, I see God. I wonder whether he practices these exercises. And the second point then is to look and see how this king speaks to the people, how he acts, how he... Have you noticed that the Pope never puts his foot wrong in public? It's always kindness and gentleness and da 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 da, -da. Have you ever seen him throw a tantrum? That's probably for the inner chamber. Then you have an addition. You start doing penance. But your penance must be interior as well as exterior. And you must have a chastisement. So you start punishing yourself. For example, eating. You leave off the superfluous. To leave off the superfluous is not penance but temperance. It is penance when you leave off from the suitable and the more and more the greater and better provided the person does not injure himself and that there is no notable in the illness that follows. In other words, temperance is what we advocate. Is that right? But their penance is something totally different. You don't use any condiments. You eat your food only bland. You have just one horrible-looking gruel to sustain your life then you are suffering for God. And then when it comes to sleeping, you do the same thing. It's not penance to leave off the superfluous or the delicate or the soft things, but it is penance when one leaves off from the suitable and the more and the more the better. So why sleep on a nice soft mattress if you can sleep on the hard floor? Why be nice and warm when you can be just on the verge of not being cold? So you sleep on the floor. And if you can make that uncomfortable by putting a couple of pebbles under your head, then so much the better. And then you chastise the flesh. You add something to create pain, to remind you, to beat yourself, to hit yourself. And that's why Catholicism practices this. And why the Opus Dei proponents do the same thing. Remember, these are Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises. 
Then you must praise religious orders, virginity, and continence. This must become your life goal to praise all these religious orders and to stand in awe of them and virginity and abstinence and not eating and lying on hard floors. And you must praise vows of religion and then you must praise relics of the saints. Is this biblical? No, you would never even dream of doing something like that or could you be duped into doing something like this without you knowing? It'll have to be very subtle, all right? And then praise constitutions about fasts and abstinence and Lent and this and that. All these feast days. Like the Roman Catholic Church has a 40-day Lent. Maybe you could be duped into a 40 days of purpose. Uh, hint, hint. And then the first rule is all judgment must be laid aside... And we ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey all the true spouse of Christ our Lord, which is our Holy Mother, the church hierarchy, has to say. So I become a brainwashed moron who doesn't test anything, then I'm a good student. And you hold that that which is white, what I see is black, if the hierarchical church decides so. This is directly his spiritual exercises, and this is not hearsay, this comes directly from the Jesuit webpage, directly. And they are to obey perende et cadaver, like a corpse, and we saw that the present Pope says he praises them for this. Now, let's ha see how they use spiritual exercises today. This is the National Jesuit News. And they say spiritual exercises belong to their church. They involve lay and Jesuit colleagues in a fruitful way. They create spiritual conversation, community, which Americans yearn for. They help religious women offer gifts, etc., 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 etc. They are being used for and by and with lay people in many formats all around the world and then supply the basis of sophisticated spiritualities for the marketplace. Spiritual exercises are being used as an apostolic instrument by better educated laity. So are they alive and well and living in America? Yes. Then you have retreats, Ignatian retreats. You have either eight-day retreats for contemplation and spiritual exercises or lay retreats. And here's the Jesuit review, and it says, Tetloff writes, philosophy continues at the heart of the Jesuit liberal arts curriculum. So a system of philosophy replaces the gospel. Now, I want to quickly take you to the Alpha Course because people think the Alpha Course is great. Now, I have nothing against small groups. Small groups coming together to worship God and study the Bible, great. But the Alpha Course has a particular structure and it was founded by Nicky Gumbel. And in the U.S., for example, what is Alpha? It's a 10-week practical introduction to the Christian faith. It gives people an opportunity to explore big life questions. And it looks great. Fuels commitment of a long-time Christian. Alpha guests explore Christianity by participating in 15 sessions. What is the meaning of life? Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus die? It looks so innocuous. How should we tell others? Nothing wrong with that. And so you are roped into... Our church never participates in Alpha courses, no. Does it? The power of Alpha. Since coming to the United States in 1996, the same year that the Bishop of London appointed Gumbel Alpha churches, it has grown exponentially. Excited about the marriage of spiritual formation and evangelism that Alpha brings. So it brings you more than just those little questions. Here's something new. What else does it bring? Well, number one, Nicky Gumbel says there's no difference 
between Protestants and Catholics. Totally insignificant compared to the things that unite us. We make it a rule in Alpha never to criticize another denomination. And more and more in our own ranks we hear, don't criticize, don't criticize. We make it a rule, don't criticize. Oh, that's judgmental. And Alpha is a powerful evangelical tool. It doesn't contain anything that is contrary to Catholic doctrine. And here is this wonderful liaison between Gumbel and the previous Pope. It is a great honor to meet this Pope. And uh, baptism and Holy Communion, parts of it are carefully scripted to meet uh, Roman Catholicism's needs. In the Alpha Course, the Holy Spirit is mediated through the hands of leaders and through the slain in the Spirit experience. Uh, I don't want that experience, and not from the hands of these leaders. And then the Alpha News nearly always concentrates on the Holy Spirit experience. So that was a Vatican II initiative. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for she, she shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come, and he will glorify me. Those are the duties of the Holy Spirit. He will receive of mine, he will show it unto you. We all need the power of the Spirit. But the Spirit is there to serve others, not to have some spiritual experience which puts me into some kind of rapture. Now these cell groups, if they were just small groups coming together to worship God, that would be great, but they're not. They have a certain stru structure. They have a coach, a spiritual director. They are designed to bring people to consensus theology. There may never be any argument about religion. There may be no criticism. You must have consensus theology. Excuse me. Sunday keeping, Saturday keeping. Can we reach a consensus? How about Wednesday keeping? Now the following quotes are from the training manual for running effective cell groups. This is a Protestant manual, not a Catholic manual. Cell group caters for pastoral care, individual needs, and has a specific structure, duration, forms the bridge between people and the church. Okay. Every group member is evangelized, consolidated, built up as a disciple, and sent. There's a specific time. It has one hour. It has an introduction, a praise, a prayer, a subject, the application, the final activities. Deviations from the format is not permitted. It's a very strict structure. Members are not permitted to change cell groups. You must come to consensus within your group. If you find this group irritates you, you're not allowed to change to another. You've got to stay there. Murmuring and criticism is not permitted. It comes directly from the manual for the coaches. Models for success declare that success is yours. That's the power of positive thinking. <laughs> Obedience and respect for leadership is essential. You will do what you're told. The leader will seek counsel of his or her trained superior in the church and trust of his or her disciples. Moreover, the disciples must be encouraged to confide in the leader regarding their problems. Hello, now I have a car father confessor. And then we have a 12 around one model. Jesus took three and a half years to train the 12, and so the cell group uses the 12 around one concept. Jesus did not choose 13, but he chose 12. The secret is in the 12. Hello. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I will be with you. I don't mind if there are 12. 
But I don't have a nervous breakdown if, they, if I don't reach the 12 because the 12 is, oh, the structure before the power starts emanating. This is pathetic. Now, I, I've made this very thick, and I've given the quote so that nobody can say it's not like that. Government of the 12 definition. A revolutionary leadership model that consists of the leader who chooses 12 people so that his or her character and authority can be reproduced in them so that the vision of the church can be developed. Will you please internalize that? I thought Christianity was about emanating the character of Christ, not some spiritual leader. Isn't that so? This is horrendous. This is Roman Catholic Jesuit thinking. You surrender your mind, you come perende a cadaver like a corpse. By the way, here's the Rosicrucian web page, which is straight occult. And it says, we use the 12 around one model in the Rosicrucian order because there's power in it. It's an occult way of thinking in Protestantism. In the section on intercession, we confirm the team of 12 to satisfy the needs of the group of 12 to enjoy the protection from evil, to attain sanctification, to build and maintain like-mindedness, and to raise up the disciples to the same level of servitude as their mentor. Good grief. To satisfy the needs of the group. I become totally dependent on my group. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I put my needs in the hands of God, not some uh, mentor. What is he, if he should have a stroke? What happens to me then? <laughs> Isn't that so? To attain sanctification and to attain no higher level than whoever this person is. What is if a druggie? Martin Luther wrote about repentance. The true way to Christianity is this, that a man do first acknowledge himself by the law to be a sinner and that it is impossible for him to do any good work. For the law says thou art an evil tree and therefore all that thou thinkest, speakest, or doest is against God. Matthew, for whosoever is not of faith is sin. When a man is thus taught and instructed by the law, then he is terrified and humbled, then he seeth indeed the greatness of his sin and cannot find in himself one spark of the love of God. Therefore he justifies God in his word and confesses that he is guilty of death and eternal damnation. And the first part then of Christianity is the preaching of repentance and the knowledge of ourselves. Nothing like that in the Alpha course. You skip it. You go directly to the holy status of your mentor. Jesuit retreats, only the director who has grasped the mind and heart of the Ignatian spirituality, which is distinguished service of Christ, to the church really, can fulfill his task of adapting the exercises to the needs of the particular group. The ritual, says New Age priest Baron, was very deceptive. The average Christian would probably find nothing seriously objectionable. Yet this meditation procedure was a product of Satan designed to lead people into accepting the voice of masquerading demons as being the voice of the Holy Spirit. Pretty straightforward stuff. Spiritual direction is one of the classical Christian dis disciplines that people from a wide variety of Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox backgrounds are discovering. So says the Protestant magazine Christianity Today. It says it was especially in the Roman Catholic Church owes its greatest debt to the founder of the Society of Jesus. So they say it comes directly from the Jesuits. 
The article continues and states that Loyola's retreats focus on sin and its consequences, the life of Christ, guidelines that deal with temptations of the devil, the passions and the resurrections, and all of those things, but in the wrong context. Look what Micah says. Trust ye not in a friend, put not your confidence in a guide, keep the doors of your mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Don't trust in a spiritual director. Don't even trust your wife. She can't save you. Christ can save you. Now that doesn't mean I cannot share with a friend. I share with a friend. Where's Francie? Francie is here. Francie. Well, thank you. I talk a lot to him. If I have a problem, I'll share it with him. But have my deepest sins got anything to do with him? Nothing. I'll share them with Christ. The Spirit is nowhere more present and alive than in his own sacred writings, says Martin Luther. We must let the Scripture have the chief place and be its own truest, simplest, and clearest interpreter. I want Scripture alone to rule and not to be interpreted according to my spirit or that of any other man, but to be understood in its own light, per sipsam, and according to its own spirit. And the spirit of prophecy says, let all be educated to search the Scriptures, to be constantly looking unto Jesus and not to human agents. That doesn't mean I can't go to a Bible study with someone who knows the Bible well, but I must still check, is he what he's saying or she's saying in harmony with the Word of God or is it not? So, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way in which thou shalt go. Now let's put it into practice. Let's start with Shula. In the foreword of the book, Robert Shula, in, his book, uh, in the book of uh, Yonggi Cho, he says, the fourth dimension of this book, he says, I discovered the reality of the dynamic dimension in prayer that comes through visualizing. Don't try to understand it, just start to enjoy it. It's true, it works, I tried it. So don't even think about it, just do it. Who said, visualize the place? Ignatius Loyola said so. The psychologist so Michael Yapko says many times therapists aren't even aware that they're doing hypnosis. They're doing is what is called guided imagery or visualization or guided meditation, which are all very mainstream hypnotic techniques. It's hypnosis. I found this fascinating. Fascinating. This is a web page which speaks of Carl Jung's experiences. Mystical Experience Registry, Jung's Recorded Active Imagination Experience. Carl Jung did exactly the same thing. Now, I'm going to read this to you. I know it's wrong, but poof, this is mind-boggling. Jung uses a visual technique that he has found helps him go deeper into active imagination. This technique is realistic visualization of descending a great distance. You go down. Please note, you don't go up. Alice in Wonderland, did you go up or did you go down? You go down. Then you have this wonderful experience. And before Alice in Wonderland comes up out of the darkness, she receives the instructions of what life is all about. So you get your instruction from the abbess. Madison Square Gardens has a beautiful Alice in Wonderland. Oh, let's not go there. In this experience, he figures that he has descended about a thousand feet. There he discovers a cosmic abyss. Next, he sees something like a moon crater, and then he has a feeling that he is in the land of the dead. Near the, we serve the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Eh? Near the steep slope of a rock, he catches the sight of two people, one an old man and the other a beautiful young girl. That gets interesting. He summons up his courage and approaches them. He listens carefully to what they say. The old man turns out to be the biblical figure Elijah. And the girl is Salome. What a strange couple, he muses. 
But Elijah tells Jung that he and Salome belong together for all eternity. This is mind-boggling. Elijah, the Elijah message. John the Baptist, an antitype of the Elijah message. Seventh-day Adventism, an antitype of the Elijah message. Who asked for his head on a platter? Salome. So Elijah and the one who asks for the head are intricately connected for all eternity. That's yin-yang philosophy, the knowledge of good and evil intricately connected to each other, never to be separated. And then there's a large black snake and, and uh, Jung sticks to Elijah and keeps his distance from Salome. So he cho chooses to follow the light part of the occult, not the dark part of the occult, but it wouldn't make any difference if he chose the other. Now, we've seen Jung, we've seen Ignatius Loyola. Now let's put them together. St. Louis University. Ignatian passion, that is a Jesuit university. Carl Jung and spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Presenter, so-and-so Moore, PhD, is special assistant to the president of Georgetown University. Is that another Jesuit university? Yes. What do a 20th century Swiss psychoanalyst and a 16th century Spanish mystery have, mystic have to say to each other? This workshop is based on the premise that Carl Jung offers a uniquely compatible psychological framework for understanding the dynamic of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Have we got a marriage between psychoanalysis and exercises of a Loyola, yes or no? And for what reason? To bring it into the church. This is spiritism at its highest level. Let's find it in every sphere of life. Now this is worship. So brothers and sisters, whether you are an Oprah fan, whether you do sport on an organized basis and not for physical exercise, whether you are involved in any sphere of life, you are worshipping at the throne of Satan. Let me show you. Oprah Winfrey website. According to Marianne, A Course in Miracles is a self-study program of spiritual psychotherapy. A Course in Miracle was written by Helen Schuchman, a psychotherapist, and it was a channeled work which makes you Christ and you don't need Jesus Christ and you don't need Christ to enter into heaven. So this is a godless thing and Oprah has just started this new religion where she's deity. Fascinating. The power of meditation. Here they go. Don't worry if nothing miraculous happens in the next five minutes as long as you spend five minutes of quiet time with yourself just turning your vision inward. Here we go. Visualization. Oprah. So you just start there and you'll be surprised by the discipline that comes from doing it on a regular basis. So they're training people to do that. Let's go to the Olympics. One world, one dream. Did you know the Jesuits? They're the ones in the government. They're the ones behind professional sport. The owners of the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Knights of Malta, the owner of the Detroit Lions, the Knights of Malta, they run the sports world. Visualization, sports psychology, mind training for triathlon, whatever the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Consensual op opponent is visualization. So you have to meditate success. Effective visualization is the answer to overcoming most triathletes' problems, automatic res relaxation, hypnotic recordings. You start having mantras, repeating words over and over and over. And look at all of them. If you're a swimming trainer, here's Trey Townsend, hypnosis director, mind over matter. Here is the great uh, 
psychotherapist, hypnotherapist, author, coach, champion, of coach for Olympians. They all practice hypnosis. Is master educator, mental training to achieve peak performance, trains Olympic athletes. And what does he use? The power of visualization, hypnosis. What do the New Ages use? Visualization, an excerpt from the I Am Discourses. So whether you're a New Ager, whether you're doing sport, whether you're watching Oprah Winfrey, or whether you're sitting in church, are you worshipping at the same altar? Yes. Even Dave Hunt said, occultism has always involved three techniques for changing and creating reality. Thinking, speaking, and visualization. That's what they do. Shula says, you don't know what power you have within you. You make the world into anything you choose. Yes, you can make your world into whatever you want to be. That's exactly what the Jesuits teach. It's important to remember that meditation in any form is the harnessing of by human means of God's divine laws. I have the power. The most effective in mantras employ the M sound. So I stand there and go, mm, 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 make a total idiot of myself. Shula says, move into moods of meditation, draw energy from the centers of sacred solitude. Note, note the words. Solitude, serenity, sacred silence. Find yourself coming alive in the garden of prayer called meditation. But this meditation is not Christian meditation. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. That's biblical. To think and to pray to God and to talk to God and to read his word, that's Christian meditation. Not sitting down in a knot in a quiet place going, um, um, um. Shula teaches that the church's problem is that it had a God-centered theology for centuries when it needed a man-centered one. Did you internalize that? Now, where did he get this ridiculous idea from? At the conclusion of the Vatican II, Pope Paul told the bishops that the church had decided to opt for man, to serve man, to help him build his home on this earth. Man with his ideas and his aims, man with his hopes and fears, man in his difficulties and sufferings, that was the centerpiece of the church's interest, said the pontiff to his bishops. We need a man-based religion. I don't come to church to worship man or myself. I come to church to worship Jesus. And if there are broken people and people that irritate me in the church, and there always are, <laughs> that shouldn't put me off because I'm here to worship Jesus. And the broken people we can help and the irritating people you can hug. Then they become less irritating. Amen. You notice that? Good. So where did he get his, his silly idea from? From Rome. Self-esteem then or pride in being a human being is the single greatest need facing the human race today, he says. We need this self-esteem. But the Bible says the opposite in 2 Timothy. This know also that in the last days will come, you know, lovers of themselves self-esteem, all of these things, and the, then it's run down. And we read in the spirit of prophecy, by beholding Christ you become changed until you hate your former pride, your former vanity and self-esteem. Adventism is the exact opposite of the Jesuit teaching. Satan is the master of reversal to turn the gospel on its head without anybody knowing it because he can use this exact terminology that's in the Bible in the reverse sequence. Brilliant. Ellen White said, it is, please note this quote, comes from the Review and Herald, 
June 18. It is through this avenue of self-esteem and self-sufficiency that Satan will seek to ensnare the people of God. Is it alive and well and coming to your church? Resist it with every fiber of your being. It is not from above, it is from below. Shula and Rome, I don't even have to tell you, he sympathizes with Rome. He speaks on their talk shows. He had his crystal palace blessed by the Pope. He is the one who says, go back to Papa. I'm dreaming a bold, impossible dream that positive thinking believers in God will rise above the illusion that our sectarian religions have imposed upon the world. We need to come together. We need ecumenism. Don't listen when people say we must make our uh, doctrines less prominent. We must be more engaging. Speak the truth. This is a separating message, not a joining message. Let's take it a step further. The little children of Robert Shuler are these people, the Bill Hybelses and the Willow Creeks, spawning the children. Now let's see what they teach. And now it gets painful. Do we as a church permit pastors to be trained at Willow Creek, yes or no? Yes, in their hordes. Do we at our colleges have Willow Creek theology entrenched, yes or no? Yes. Does that make my church Babylon? No. I won't tell you what it does it to her. I'll tell you that in a quote from Jeremiah. Let's see what they teach. Visualization, formation, mentoring, coaching, spiritual direction, consensus, ecumenism. is directly from their webpage. Seismic shift into spiritual community, changing face of worship, stemming the tide. Whew. What is taught here? Meditation promoter, Kerry Kent, uh, writes monastic communities. Monasticism? Martin Luther said monasticism was the worst evil that had ever come to this planet. Even Henry VIII, who was a despot king, when he cleaned up the monastic system in England, they were horrified at the horrors they found in the basements of monasticism. Here they're promoting it. The emergent church. And who are the ones that they identified? Scott McKnight, who talks about mystic shift. Matthew Fox. Good grief, Matthew Fox, who believes in the cosmic messiah who will come and jesuit priest paul mcinto they don't even hide it on their web pages there it is and they talk about uh, richard raw who talks about father mother god and this idea that our feminine side our gentle caring side comes from the feminine part of the deity which is the holy spirit have you heard that the holy spirit is feminine didn't Mary conceive by the Holy Spirit? That's lesbianism. <laughs> it's pathetic. The Bible calls him he, doesn't it? When he comes, not when she comes. I can't even read it. It makes me sick. Willow Creek Magazine. 30 years ago, we went into all of this. Scott McKnight came and taught there. Let's just get the buzzwords. Solitude, silence, fasting, contemplative approach to Scripture and prayer. Oh, I've had to sit through so many Willow Creek sermons at camp meetings and other places. I want to die. A Willow Creek sermon consists of quoting one Bible text. Jesus heals the blind man. 
or Bartholomeus, or whatever. One verse. Or the man born blind and healed by Jesus. And then you take this concept and you embroider the concept. You visualize, you pray, your sermon is a visual prayer. You sketch the drama from his birth to Jesus to afterwards. And you have the parents giving birth to a blind baby and the tears and the pain and the this and the horrible life of this poor person in squalor and pain and suffering and stubbing his toe and blood and sister screaming, crying, poor. And when you've got the whole congregation in tears, you have to get shares in some tissue company though, otherwise you have a problem then your sermon has been successful. Now what have the people had out of that sermon? An emotional experience. And when they come home, they're just as empty as when they went in. This is not a sermon. Sermon is food. What does the Word of God tell me? Not what do I visualize in my mind with some stupid concept. Excuse me, I'm being very hard here. But the time for wishy-washing is over. Well, what about Rick Warren? Let's see what he teaches. The global strategist, the man who is a member of the CFR, who belongs to Oxford Analytica, whether they are atheists who don't believe in God or whatever, these think tanks, these are the great people of the world. He says, my deep conviction that anybody can be one to Christ if you discover the key to his or her heart, it may take some time to identify it, but the most likely place is to start with the person's felt needs. Here we go. Make it man-based theology, not Christ-based theology. God won't ask about your religious background or your doctrinal views. The only thing that will matter is did you accept Jesus and the last thing many believers need today is to go to another Bible study. They already know far more than they are putting into practice. Good grief. And he advocates breath prayers. What's a breath prayer? Have you heard of a breath prayer? A breath prayer is saying something on a repetitive basis using one breath. Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus. Whatever, till you fall over unconscious. You repeat it over and over and over again. What does the Bible call that? Repetitive prayer. It calls it stupidity. And yet we have members in our own ranks who say, sit down and start meditating and use one word over and over again. It can be the word Jesus. Just say it a million times, Jesus, Jesus, until your brain dead, and then I can put into your mind whatever I want. Spiritual formation movement. We'll come to, what is spiritual formation? Vital message for the church. This is it. We have to preach spiritual formation. Solitude. He promotes the book Sacred Pathway. And they have these saddleback speakers speaking about our spiritual journey. It's particularly difficult to describe this type of prayer in writing as it is best taught in person. In general, however, centering prayer works like this. Choose a word, just like I said. Jesus, Father, for example, as a focus for contemplative prayer, repeat the word silently in your mind for a set amount of time, say 20 minutes. I'd be nuts by then. Until your heart seems to be repeating the word by itself, just as naturally and involuntarily as breathing. Where did you hear this before? Isn't this the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola? Ah, oh, spirit of prophecy, thank you. <laughs> Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. 
Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, it brings us up to him. I don't go into an abyss of stupidity in order to be enlightened. Spirit of prophecy, there are two kinds of prayer, the prayer of form and the prayer of faith. The repetition of set customary phrases when the heart feels no need of God is formal prayer. When you pray, says Christ, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. But the prayer that comes from an earnest heart when the simple wants of the soul are expressed, just as we would ask an earthly friend for a favor, expecting that it would be granted, this is the prayer of faith. It's so simple, it's so beautiful, it's so sublime. I have a friend, I can speak to him, I don't need a stupid ritual. So if your pastor says to you, we're going to do something different, relax. Let your hands fall down. Let's repeat something over. Jump up and down and say, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to gym or something. Just get their minds off it. Ecumenism, of course, he supports it. Interfaith, of course, he supports it. We're all a happy family. The God of Islam and the God of the Bible are one and the same. We must just not concentrate on the differences. Have you heard that? I hear it all the time. Rick Warren practices the peace plan. In fact, he says, this is why God made me. Everything else I have done was simply preparation for the peace plan. What is the peace plan? Plant churches, equip leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. Please note, there's no Jesus here. This is form. Now let's take that peace plan and correlate it with the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, develop global partnership. Plant churches. Work in the churches with a partnership. Lifelong learning. Equip servant leaders. Lifelong learning. Eradicate poverty. Assist the poor. Reduce child mortality. Care for the sick. Achieve universal education. Educate. It's exactly the same thing. So whether it's the government, whether it's the churches, they're all working together. The UN Millennium End Goals are exactly the same. Now, let's go to spiritual formation. What is spiritual formation? I want to know what it is. They tell you it's a new experience with God where you have this fantastic relationship with God and you experience Him in reality. By the way, then it's no longer faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is experiential religion. It's against the word of God. No matter how fancily they try to give it even an Adventist flair, it's Jesuit, finished. Teilhard de Chardin taught that we can become God and that we merge with the Godhood and that we become one, and the words he used is value genesis, collective co-creation, combined effort, omega point, cosmogenesis, cosmos coming together, new genesis, minds coming together. We've seen this, consensus theology, a way with that which makes us peculiar, our strange doctrines on the Antichrist and this and that. <laughs> Don't preach that. Three angels' messages. Ooh. We need a convergence of religions. We need a universal Christ. There's no difference between Jesus and Muhammad. Modern Christianity has been molded by this Jesuit encounter theology. Vatican II says, in forming the consciences, the faithful must pay careful attention to the sacred and certain teachings of the church. So who becomes the norm now? The Bible or the church? So is the theologian who runs the church the one who determines for me what I must believe and think? Or is the Bible and the spirit of prophecy what tells me what I should believe and think? Whew. The education 
of the conscience is indispensable for human beings who are subjected to negative influence and tempted by sin to prefer their own judgment and to reject authoritative teachings. So what is formation? Let's have it defined. What it really is and not what they tell you what it is, developing this experience, this literal experience with God. This is what it is. Opus Dei and formation. The way a collection of 999 religious maxims. Why not 1,000? Why 999? Because that's a 666 upside down. And the founder is Escriva, and he says, the true Christian must be disciplined and obedient to a spiritual director. Then you're formed. In other words, you are formed when you're brainwashed not to think for yourself. When you will not see the difference anymore between truth and error, but you've become part of the universal soup. Let it never happen to you as Seventh-day Adventists. Let it never happen to you. Maxim 377 of the way says, And how shall I acquire our formation? How shall I keep our spirit by being faithful to the specific norms of your, di your director gave you and explained to you and made you love? Be faithful to them and you will be an apostle. Rise no higher than the theologian who controls you. May God help us from this pharisaical thinking. Here's the general congregation, and here is the text of the homily of the papal legate when they chose the latest black pope. Go away. I find this fascinating. This is the speech made by the papal legate. Certainly a necessity during this congregation you are carrying out an important work but it is not a distraction from your apostolic activity. As St. Ignatius teaches you the spiritual exercises you must with the same vision of the three divine divine persons look to the entire surface of the earth crammed with men listening to the spirit carries on and on and on I'm not going to do it all and then he says brother Jesuits that you provide a religious and apostolical formation following an Ignatian spirituality there are many people from both within and outside the church who frequent your centers of learning. Is Willow Creek one of them? Well, if they teach what the Jesuits teach, they must be one of theirs. Seeking a response to the challenge for, with science. Receiving a formation. So the world has to be brainwashed. The spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius are your spirituality, this masterpiece of Catholic spirituality. And it, of course, combines scripture and tradition. Let's see how it hops. Who's heard the name Richard Foster? You must have heard it. It's being branded all over the place. He's the founder of Renovare, and he's talking about new spirituality, meditative and contemplative. And here's their webpage, contemplative prayer, holiness, charismatic, social justice, anything but the gospel. And what does that mean? It means uh, to renew spiritual formation, spiritual gifts, spiritual exercises, acts of service. This is a totally new gospel. <coughs> he writes celebration of discipline. How is this to be achieved? How do we do this? The inner world of meditation is most easily entered in through the door of imagination. I've heard Adventist pastors quote these people. And I think to myself, where are you going? Richard Foster goes on, Ignatius of Loyola in his spiritual exercises constantly encouraged his readers to visualize. <coughs> he quotes the Jesuits directly. A 
And nobody seems to care. Where does this stuff come from? Foster likes to call medieval mystics. Now, that, come on now, it gets ridiculous. Like uh, Meister Eckhart, Dominican monks. And he says, go to these saints. You make always a human being your example. Never Christ. Go to Saint so-and-so. This is Protestantism. This is no longer Protestantism. This is Catholicism. Resources for simple living. Suggested resources. Here's the Jesuit webpage. They say there, read Richard Foster. There, they quote him. The Jesuits train their students with this. Or the Be Still DVD. The wonderful thing about contemplative prayer that it can be found anywhere, everywhere, anytime, for anyone. You become a portable sanctuary. And you, you become a zombie. The object is to move from conscious communication with God to being in the presence. So any, any norm can work. The Spirit can tell you anything. No wonder that the papacy has no problem with Buddhism because this is exactly what Buddhism teaches. No wonder Mother Teresa, there she is, buying before a Buddhist statue, has no problem buying before any icon. She's dead now. Her poor little nuns had to sleep on that hard floor with only a something on them. And they had to be so deprived of food that they all looked like anorexia nervosas. Buddhist monks are training Catholic priests. And they're doing sacred dancing. Isn't that nice? Or, eh, whatever. I'm not even going to read this one. And then we have body prayers. Our bodies have a vocabulary. Simple breath prayers. Simple body prayer. A body blessing. Could this ever come into the Adventist church? Here's a body prayer. May your body be blessed. May you realize that your body is a faithful and beautiful friend of your soul and may be peaceful and joyful and recognize that your senses are sacred thresholds. May you realize holiness is mindful, gazing, feeling, hearing, touching. So now you're sitting in this prayer situation and you're smelling the aroma of Mary's perfume or whatever. And you're touching Jesus and you're holding on to him like the widow held on to his dress. You see him turning round. You hear the words he speaks to you. Is that spiritism or is that the gospel? Spiritism. It's spiritism. I'm sacred dancing. I'm going to skip all these. Shalom, sacred dance. Here are the papacy using sacred dance using sacred dancing around the altar during the Mass, having all these white-clad, white-robed ladies. This is the Pope's 2008 visit to the United States, dancing around. And uh, now I want to close by showing you what's happening to the Protestant world. This is the Methodist Center for Spiritual Formation. This is Protestantism. Spiritual formation. Gatherings are a day or a weekend retreat. Ignatian retreat. The prayer of the labyrinth. Counting the Holy Spirit on the journey within. Where do you find the Holy Spirit? In here. And you walk in a labyrinth like an idiot. Going round and round and round. Going goof, goof, goof against this and backwards and forwards. And so you find the spiritual peace. Labyrinth prayer. Mona what kind of web page is this? Methodist web page. Monastic spirituality. I thought Protestantism had kicked out monasticism. Didn't Martin Luther marry a nun? Yes. Who left monasticism with its, with its stupidity and came out and married him. And what a wonderful wife she was to him too. He had six children. He made up for monasticism. <laughs> monasticism and spirituality have always been two sides of the same coin. 
So we need monastic communities, Protestant monastic communities. Have we gone nuts? Thais worship. Have you heard that? This wonderful monastic Thais community in France. This is Protestantism. And this hypnotic, beautiful music with every second word, the Holy Spirit. And we sing these things. And, uh, you know, we sing them too. Let me not go there. Anyway, so join in prayer, silence, unique meditative style of singing, which draws the young and the not so young to ties, so you have the specialized singing techniques. An introduction to iconography. This is a Protestant Methodist webpage. So you learn to work with uh, a Greek Orthodox Church spiritual director tells you how to use icons. Protestantism. Journaling through active imagination, wellness and health. See, you can use a good thing and you can turn it into an occult thing. Let's take the Presbyterian webpage. We cooperate with the work of the Spirit through certain practices that make us more open and responsive to the Spirit's touch. Right, here's the bottom line. Is there anything physical, practical, that I can do to open myself to the Spirit? Yes or no? Is there a way that I can sit that the Spirit will say, I can't resist the way this man is sitting. I have to come to him. Yes or no? No. Is there a certain way I can breathe that the Holy Spirit says, man, look at this man breathing in this way. I can't resist him. I'm going to go and help him. Is, is there something like that? Is there something I can repeat over and over and over again to make the Spirit so exciting that he jumps down my throat? Yes or no? No. Anything that you have to do on a physical basis to attract God's attention is rubbish. The only way we communicate with God is through His Word, accepting His Word, accepting it by faith, and acting upon it by the principle. And then accepting He said so, therefore it is. If I have anything on my heart, I can pour it out to God as to a friend. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which is a one-on-one -on -one relationship, and I don't have to go through Joe Soap or Joe Slovo. It makes no difference. Agreed? Guard yourself against these things. These things are dangerous. They are not from God. Look at what these people are doing. Sacred center, historical archetypes. You go back to all these Saints, they're dead. They're dust. They can't help you. Labyrinths, rituals, labyrinth formations, sacred circles, all of these things. Start using beads. Good grief, I was a Catholic. I could recite, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you, blessed are thou with women, blessed are the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us, and us now in the hour of our death. Amen. Ten times. And when I was in a hurry, I could say, Holy Mary, full of God, for us, and us now in the hour of our death. Amen. Do you think God was impressed when I said ten Hail Marys, one Our Father, ten Hail Marys, one Our Father? I don't think so. Why should I do it in Protestantism? I'm not going to go here. Now, sealing. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What does it mean to be sealed? Bind the testimony, seal the law amongst my disciples. In other words, internalize the word of God. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. If you want to be spiritually formed in the biblical sense, then internalize the word of God and act upon it. You will be spiritually formed. 
If you are brainwashed to the point of obedience and giving up the doctrines which make this church what they are, then you will have received another spiritual formation which is not from God. If your religion has been changed into satisfying your spiritual needs rather than crying out to the Spirit of God to help you to save others, then you have been duped. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand. That's the formation I want. O oh, house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O oh, house of Israel. God is calling his people back to basics. Back to the Word of God. Back to the spirit of prophecy. Stop all your fears and your, your thoughts about is it authentic, is it not authentic, was there plagiarism, was there not plagiarism. I received faxes in the beginning that were as long as this hall against the spirit of prophecy. I went through every single one of them. They're not valid. There are many, many uh, articles that you can use. Start believing the prophets. Believe the prophets and you will be established. Start Bible studies. Work in groups for all I care, but don't freak if there are not 12. And study the Bible together. And if you think the person is talking nonsense, then say, show me in the Word of God. And when you come to consensus on something, make sure that it's a consensus based on the Word of God. It's not difficult. And make God your friend, not your ritual. That's true religion. We don't need this stuff in the church. And I've shown you the web pages of the Protestants. I could just as well have shown you the web pages of the Seventh day Adventist Church, but I didn't. I didn't. And it doesn't make my church Babylon. And I will show you in the next few lectures that, in spite of all the things that are coming into this church, in this church there's a spitting out, not a coming out. And I don't want to be spat out, and I don't think any of you want to be either. May God help us because this is the omega of all apostasies. It's the same as the alpha in another form because it will be a reliance on self and a spiritualistic formation which is new age, which is divinity of self, which is pantheism. And we don't need pantheism. We need faith in a literal, personal creator God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is almost impossible to believe that this counter-reformation has swallowed and gobbled up almost your entire Protestant heritage. And Lord, even we are under attack. Lord, I pray that you will preserve us and make us people of the book. It is written. Preserve us in Jesus' name. Amen.